Уважаемые граждане России, дорогие друзья, еще в 2008 году Россия выдвинула инициативу о заключении договора о европейской безопасности. Смысл его состоял в том, чтобы ни одно государство, ни одна международная организация в Евроатлантике не могли бы укреплять свою безопасность за счет безопасности других. Могу здесь сослаться и на хартию европейской безопасности ОБСЕ 1999 года, принятую в Стамбуле, и на Астанинскую декларацию ОБСЕ 2010 года. Другими словами, выбор способов обеспечения безопасности не должен создавать угрозы для других государств. В Киеве давно провозгласили стратегический курс на вступление в НАТО. Да, безусловно, каждая страна имеет право выбирать собственную систему обеспечения безопасности, заключать военные союзы. И все вроде бы так, если бы нет. Но в международных документах прямо зафиксирован принцип равной и неделимой безопасности которые, как известно, включает в себя обязательство не укреплять свою безопасность за счет безопасности других государств. Благодарю вас за внимание. In his last address before the start of a special military operation in Ukraine, Putin recognized the independence of Luhansk and Donetsk in what was then yet another escalation, and what's more, as we know today, the prelude to his invasion. His speech is important for many reasons when you disregard the typically Soviet performance of public lying. We can find the determining framework in which Putin wants to talk about Russia and its relationship to others, that of international security. In particular, he mentions that no state should increase its security at the detriment of the security of others, that Russia has tried to cooperate with the West in the field of security, and that the West is arming with offensive weapons and not merely defensive ones. Much of this is deception, of course, it doesn't take a video to tell you that. The rules to this deception, however, their language, their internal logic, are rooted in what international relations scholars call offense-defense theory, or alternatively the security dilemma. Never wishing to prevent you from enjoying this great intellectual bounty, I want to present to you the notion of security dilemma, as outlined by Robert Jervis in his article from 1978, Cooperation under the security dilemma, the full text of which is in the Discourse Library channel. And yes, before you ask, we all dress the same. So, the security dilemma is one of the cool tools of international relations theory that is general enough to be able to be applied to everything, so I keep it close to my heart. And though others use it, Jervis presented it best, and although it came to be a debated topic, it's making a big comeback for various reasons I'll come to shortly. In truth, I wanted to present it as part of a further violence in the West video about the limits of rationality as a concept to politically aspire to and politically explain the world with, and we'll be dealing with that, but uh, two things happened that made me want to speed things up in regards to this. Firstly, Putin's non-stop exhortations for security assurances, which, although we'll be debunking them, fall very well within this framework, which I want to present. And secondly, Europe's security awakening, on which my friend Kraut made a video about. Shout out to small creators, by the way, go subscribe to his channel. Now, he spoke a lot about the whys of a European security architecture, and all the reason for me to talk about the mechanics through which states achieve this. All those elements are relevant. They're here, and what's more, they're here now. Hence, the name of this video. Rationality, Cooperation, Putin, and the security of others. So, without further ado, let me introduce you to Jervis. For the purposes of this video, I want to present two schools of the neo-realist current of international relations. First, there is the defensive realists, the good guys, who believe that states long for security and that this quest for security will bring forward a situation of balance of power, and thus that conflict has situational causes as opposed to structural ones. That conflicts are accidents of fate, so to speak, and not predestinated events. That's the school that Robert Jervis, our author, belongs to. The other school of thought, offensive realists, founded by John Mersheimer, believes the opposite, that states will naturally attempt to achieve hegemony over others in pursuance of that security goal, which is actually a hegemony goal, and thus that conflicts are inevitability. That school of thought is made up of evil Germans, and that automatically disqualifies it from any further references. 
for real. As an actual belief, I have to say it's quite a low bar to sink to, even for Paradox game players. It shows terrible character. To get back to our guy, Jervis tries to explain how conflicts are always products of their respective eras through the concept of security dilemmas. A security dilemma is basically a take on the famous prisoner's dilemma. You must know the drill. Already two prisoners are simultaneously presented with the choice of ratting the other out or remaining silent. In the outcome that they both keep silent, they will get light sentences, one year each. Should one betray the other and rat him out, then he will be rewarded with freedom, while the other one rots in jail for three years. But if both attempt to betray the other, they will both end up with two years each, the worst possible combined jail time. We call the two options they have C and D for cooperate and defect. For a given prisoner, we can describe any outcome of the game with those two letters. By convention, let's say the first letter describes what a given prisoner does, and the second, what his opponent does. Taking, for example, prisoner A, his preferred outcomes are in order DC, CC, DD, and CD, which give him respectively 0, 1, 2, and 3 years of jail time. In short, and in a vacuum, he always prefers that his opponent cooperates, and whether they do or not, he always prefers to betray them. You see here, the obvious contradiction, or rather hypocrisy, this is going to be a major theme here. For those who know the basics of game theory, you already know that whether cooperation or betrayal is the ideal play for any given prisoner depends on how many times the experience is repeated. If the game happens only once, or a few times, then betrayal will often get better results for a single prisoner. If it is to happen an infinity of times, then cooperation becomes the best of choices overall in the long run. Not the optimal individual strategy every time, but it does start to happen. Repeated simulations allow for complex stratagems that favor the cooperative to emerge, incorporating some of these patterns, the ability for forgiveness, lack of envy in the score of others, and the ability to retaliate against betrayal, but also, and perhaps most importantly, optimism in others, which is to start games by cooperating. Those sound like human virtues, right? Sadly, the game of history limits us in this case to a small number of games. States only have so much memory as the governments that inhabit them, leading to quote-unquote resets of the game, so to speak. That's one of, the point, one of the points of tension when applying this theory to nations. Think of all those groups of people just stuck in history due to the mass of their membership, their inertia, so to speak, and their forgetfulness those who are unable to retaliate or unable to forgive a wrong, unable to trust and unable to stop envying the success of others. For those who don't know of the prisoner's dilemma already, allow me to explain. It is a parable that demonstrates the phenomenon of rationality paradox. That is to say that less rational players of a game will achieve better results than rational ones when put together. Another way of seeing this is that players seeking to maximize their individual scores will actually jeopardize everybody's scores, including themselves. In the prisoner's dilemma, the least amount of prison for everyone will be achieved on average if everybody cooperates. But the least amount of prison, on average again, for a single person will be achieved if he betrays the other while the other cooperates. Knowing this, both players can attempt betrayal and end up in the worst possible outcome for both, multiple times if necessary. Isn't that curious, that under these conditions, both rational actors attempting to minimize their prison years will end up maximizing the total amount of years? Do you see where I'm getting at? The minimum that this suggests is that there are a few problems with the concept of rationality as we understand it and as we use it to understand. <laughs> oh, fuck! Isn't that a bad surprise? Oh, no! What a curse, my dear viewers to realize that there is such a place of such darkness that our eyes can't see, that our minds can't enter. How forlorn are we that the virtue of virtues, the soul of our modern era, the very principle of our aspirations and wants is suddenly found inappropriate and denied. This is one of the aspects of the great ill we call the crisis of modernity. Is there such a geography whose natural frontiers 
or also that of our rational selves. So, you might want to ask, where did our doctrine go so wrong? Is trying to maximize a value irrational in itself? No, that's the same as aiming for a certain outcome. Is it competition between two agents that which precludes rationality then? No, it can't. If the prisoners were not rewarded for betraying, then the rational outcome for each would coincide with the overall rational outcome. Is it then self-interest that is irrational, and should we be interested in others' well-being instead? No, not even that. It's easy to swap around the consequences of each action to make it a dilemma for those sort of people, as well as a dilemma for those who try to minimize everybody's prison time, and those who try to minimize only one given person's prison time. What is happening is that for each time the choice for each agent is predicated on what their opponent does, there exists an arrangement of outcomes that becomes unpredictable at the individual level. This means that there exist situations where everyone, literally any intelligent being you can think of, even the most intelligent, short of an omniscient god, can have the ability they use to achieve outcomes incontestably subverted, diverted, and ultimately defeated. One's victors do not have to be one's betters. In fact, though I can get in trouble for saying this with my strategically minded friends, victory or defeat can often be meaningless. In his book, The Wasteland, T.S. Eliot muses about the horrific destruction of Carthage, which he calls Phoenicians. He writes about the last holdouts burning in the temples as their families were driven into slavery, and the heroes, like Phlebas, already sunken to the bottom of the sea, the currents picking at their flesh. He says, O oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. Anyway, don't think about it too much. Yeah, these sort of discoveries happen way more often than you think. And in every serious field too. Go read a book, it'll make you into a better person. Seriously. In case you got distracted by the scared kids and the main takeaway here is that rationality has situations and times where it is limited or counterproductive. And we haven't even gotten into situations where the agents taking decisions are groups of people or teams of people and whether we can even rank things in a transitive relationship. Very few people have, actually. I like to present kind of cutting-edge things rather than rehash a wiki page. Hopefully, this sets the standards and builds a great kind of community. Anyway, do these rationality dilemma situations actually happen in reality? Oh boy. So, the prisoner's dilemma is also known outside of game theory as uh, Rousseau's stag hunt, Schelling's dilemma, or the Hobbesian trap has been cited, for instance, as the main cause of the Peloponnesian War, according to Thucydides' account of it. He wrote, What made the war inevitable was the growth of Athenian power and the fear which this caused Sparta. So, what exactly are we talking about? The premise is the following. When confronted with a potential threat that could cause a perilous war, is it better to sit tight and face potentially disastrous consequences or attack preemptively and thereby make the possibility of war a self-fulfilling prophecy. Bismarck, in one of his rare cases of lucidity, called this to commit suicide out of fear of dying. Sadly, this wisdom was found absent on the eve of the First World War when the German Empire faced or pretended to face a similar situation with regards to Russia. Now, Bismarck is known for being an okay-ish diplomat arriving after the facts of the greatest seminal events of his century, but he had to compose with these questions of how states cooperate and avoid war, and he found his own methods to the benefit of the German Empire. So, to get back to the subject, Jervis does an exquisite description of when these sort of dilemmas occur, which corresponds to the weights of the various outcomes of the prisoner's dilemma, though he does it in terms that must be explicit, he posits that a. States are rational actors, we talked about this previously, 
You may disagree, there are a few counterexamples. You may even disagree they are singular actors, but let's just move on for now. B. We live in the absence of a universal monarch, a figure that could, in the Hobbesian sense, serve as an arbiter for every situation, and that could enforce this arbitrage, so the UN doesn't count, although you can see where the intention came from when it was made. In reality, this condition is not so necessary, but serves to describe the medium in which international relations happens in Jervis's theory, that is, a state of anarchy. See, every state seeks to achieve security, or in quantifiable terms, every state seeks to increase the means by which they become more secure. And we'll be abusing this sentence by saying every state seeks to increase its own security. Finally, D. Oftentimes, when a state increases its own security, it does so to the detriment of the security of others, which are then compelled to increase their own security. From these pursuits, a dynamic of power distribution over time emerges, seemingly orbiting a sort of dynamic elastic equilibrium around the theoretical state of balance of power. Whether this pattern spirals into perfect balance or out of control into war, depends on the factors we'll be examining shortly. The short period of time in which conflict happens allows us, in terms of game theory, to posit that they are negative sum games. States do not create a significant amount of wealth, of children, of patents, and of whatever else one might want to measure as part of the human experience compared to what they expend or lose. By contrast, times when there is no conflict are positive sum games for the opposite reasons. It stands to reason, for rational actors, that situations of conflict are to be avoided and their avoidance is made by the quest for security. For example, by building fortifications or buying or constructing weapons. Now, obviously, we talked about the limits of rationality previously. Why am I insisting so much on the term? And why did I just pick a theory that posits rational actors? The keys to that very specific mystery I shall only release later. But it will do you good to guess while I set the stage. How about that? Anyway, Jervis distinguishes two phases in history, which gave way to one another depending on the technological means of the time. First, there's eras where the offensive has the advantage over the defensive. In them, wars are shorter, less costly too and more frequent for obvious and compounding reasons. There is less uh, fluidity in diplomacy, which becomes a lesser resort and thus less balance of power. When a state arms itself in this era in pursuance with their quest for security, it does so to the detriment of the security of their neighbors. For instance, if you have a million rifles, but the closest country just ordered two million, and offense has an advantage over defense, you might consider yourself in danger. Then, there's also periods in history where the defensive mindset is advantaged. In these, states can prepare their defense and arm themselves without consequences for others' security, not putting them in danger by doing so. Small states can hold out against much bigger ones, though war have a tendency to get bogged down into a grind. Great examples of these two eras are the two world wars in the Western Front. In both, France had an overall defensive strategy, and Germany had an overall offensive one. In the first, where the defensive was advantaged, France managed to hold out Germany, which had twice its population. Even Belgium got unprecedented success defending its forts in the earlier days of the war. In the second, however, not so much. Of course, in a general sense, we must make a distinction between what doctrine is actually advantaged and what doctrine is merely perceived to be so. Prior to World War I, the great powers did not take note of the lessons of the Russo-Japanese War, for instance, and still clearly preached the cult of the offensive, a most based of doctrines. Therefore, the actual course of international relations before the Great War followed mostly the rules of an offensive era. This distinction between belief and reality is not like a footnote or a historical exception, it is a working condition. Reality is very costly to figure out. Belief, on the other hand, is an easily deducible, easily signalable working hypothesis. It makes complete sense to ignore the former and focus on the latter, especially when, again, 
we are very interested in the kinds of situations where what matters most is not the substance, the means, or the rules of any kind of interactions between people, but purely the choices they are inclined to make in relation to ours. And I should remind you that we are going to talk about, <laughs> I don't know, a certain state whose doctrine it is to destabilize others to unconventional means, or what they call themselves hybrid warfare. Geography, too, has tremendous purchase on security dilemmas. Um, it has a mostly defensive function and thus eases international diplomacy and offers natural boundaries. Jervis goes so far as to say that a world with natural borders is a world without war, although one could object with the cases of Afghanistan or Morocco, Mali. Geography, though, is transformable. In particular, the time it takes to traverse and the ease with which it can be done depends entirely on the kind of infrastructure that is present. For instance, during the aptly named Great Game, the 19th century confrontation between the British and Russian empires over Afghanistan and surrounding territories, one reads in Memorandum on Seistan and other points raised in the discussion on the defense of India from one W.G. Nicholson, member of the Committee of Imperial Defense, a dilemma on railroad construction near the Persia-Afghanistan border. The conditions of the problem may be briefly summarized as follows. If we make a railway to Seistan while Russia remains inactive, we gain a considerable defensive advantage at considerable financial cost. If Russia makes a railway to Seistan while we remain inactive, she gains a considerable offensive advantage at considerable financial cost. And if both we and Russia make railways to Seistan, the defensive and offensive advantages may be held to neutralize each other. In other words, we shall have spent a great deal of money and be no better off than we were at present. On the other hand, we shall be no worse off, whereas under alternative B, we shall be much worse off. Consequently, the theoretical balance of advantage lies with the proposed railway extension from Quetta to Seista. Intelligence Department, War Office, March 20, 1903. Do notice that in the British memorandum, the railway constitutes for them a defensive advantage, whereas the railway for the Russians constitutes an offensive advantage. We'll be coming back to this. In the meantime, here's a recent allocution by Putin on the subject of military infrastructure. Тем более, что модернизированная с помощью американцев сеть аэродромов Борисполь, Ивано-Франковск, Чугуев, Одесса и так далее способна обеспечить переброску воинских частей в кратчайшие сроки. Воздушное пространство Украины открыто для полетов стратегической и разведывательной авиации США, беспилотных летательных аппаратов, которые используются для наблюдения за территорией России. Добавлю, что построенный американцами центр морских операций в Очакове позволяет обеспечивать действия кораблей НАТО, включая применение ими высокоточного оружия против российского Черноморского флота и нашей инфраструктуры на всем Черноморском побережье. В результате Альянс и его военная инфраструктура вышли непосредственно к границам России. Это и стало одной из ключевых причин кризиса евробезопасности. Самым негативным образом сказалось на всей системе международных отношений, привело к утрате взаимного доверия. Ситуация продолжает деградировать, в том числе в стратегической сфере. So, geography plays a tremendous but flexible role on security infrastructure. But of course, men of good conscience and average intelligence may jointly put in place the conditions to mitigate or even instrumentalize certain geographical determinisms. One such case is the 1922 Washington Naval Conference Agreement between Japan and the United States over security in the Pacific. Before it, the United States could not defend the Philippines without denying Japan the ability to protect her home islands. Japan similarly could not satisfy her goal of cruel imperialism over the region if it was not dominant in its surrounding seas. The following agreement was reached. Japan was to limit her navy to be three-fifths as large as that of the United States, and in exchange, the US would not fortify its Pacific islands. Taking advantage of the elasticity of a possible front line in the Pacific, this meant the following. First, the Japanese fleet would not be strong enough to defeat the US Navy anywhere except close to their home islands. Secondly, Japan could still conquer the Philippines, but would be too weakened to hold them or move farther. And lastly, an American attack would be rendered more difficult because 
American bases all across the Pacific were not protected. The peace from this did not last, of course. However, I find it elegant enough to mention, and more than that, I want to stress the double nature of this sort of diplomacy. On the one hand, obviously it has a dialectic value, it enables a dialogue of security and threat that countries can partake in yada yada, in the language of security. On the other hand, because this language of security is somewhat rooted in reality, it carries a descriptive value, and even a predictive one. It serves to highlight causes for conflicts and mechanisms of conflict, and that's really important. Here, the US and Japan agree that neither can destroy the other within their respective dominions, which are geographic, but also immaterial. Examples include West versus East of the Pacific, in detail versus in pitched battle, and in initiative versus in logistic. Considering this kind of telegraphed the Pacific Front of World War II, that is, Japan starts the conflict, instantly dominates the west of the Pacific, but forgoes to attack US logistics, and suffers a series of losses in pitched battles, mm, pretty sophisticated, wouldn't you say? The last thing we have to consider here is the following. It's not always possible to differentiate defensive or offensive weapons or weapon platforms. A stationary, a stationary machine gun, for example, has a clear defensive purpose, and so does a minefield or a fortress or, a fortress or an air defense gun. Conversely, a tank, at least in their earlier forms, can only be used offensively. Today, though, tanks can also be used as a defensive tool. For some weapon platforms, you can just never tell. For instance, a rifle can be used offensively and defensively. And a lot of Putin's recent allocutions, uh, allocutions maybe? I wouldn't know, have been about underlining or exaggerating how NATO weapon systems could be used not only for defense, but for offense as well. Так в Румынии и Польше в рамках проекта США по созданию глобальной ПРО разворачиваются позиционные районы для противоракет. Хорошо известно, что размещенные здесь пусковые установки могут быть использованы для крылатых ракет Томагавк, ударных наступательных систем. Кроме того, в США идет разработка универсальной ракеты «Стандарт-6», которая наряду с решением задач противовоздушной и противоракетной обороны может поражать и наземные, и надводные цели. То есть у якобы оборонительной системы «Про США» расширяются и появляются новые наступательные возможности. Мы четко понимаем, что при подобном сценарии уровень военных угроз для России кардинально, в разы повысится. И обращаю особое внимание, многократно возрастет опасность именно внезапного удара по нашей стране. Поясню, что в американских документах стратегического планирования в документах закреплена возможность так называемого упреждающего удара по ракетным комплексам противника. The distinction between offensive and defensive changes with doctrine, technology, terrain, and many other factors. Sometimes a defensive posture is merely the prelude to an offensive one. A perfect illustration of this is the Schlieffen Plan in World War I. Russia, seeing the German Empire make defensive preparations along their mutual border, would not be intimated to conclude that she would declare war on her very soon. Yet, so she did almost immediately. What does this mean for the international stage? Jervis distinguishes four cases depending on whether offense or defense is advantaged and whether an offensive posture is distinguishable from a defensive one or not. Firstly, in the case that defense has the advantage and that it is easy to distinguish an aggressive, warmongering posture from a defensive one, then the world is at peak stability. Expect little conflict, expect lots of cooperation, and because in this scenario, states that like to cooperate and be nice to each other are rewarded and advantaged. In the case where defense still has the advantage, but you can't distinguish an uh, enemy and someone just looking out for themselves, security dilemmas can arise, but oftentimes security requirements will be compatible. Secondly, in a world where offense has the advantage, but one can distinguish an offensive posture from a defensive one, security dilemmas aren't going to happen, but conflict is still to be expected. If, however, there is no way to distinguish preparations for invasion and preparations for defense, then we have here a doubly dangerous situation. An obvious question comes to mind. Which one are we in, Frog? Well, I already told you reality is harder to figure out than beliefs, and I'm sad to say 
that it takes a war and the countless suffering and loss that it brings to even know approximately for a time and for a place. In the field of strategy where man is involved against man, we shouldn't have the hubris to think that the key to understanding comes without mistake and sacrifices. As we said, this is a field where there are deep holes which rationality can disappear in. What we can do is make bets and mine, as last video showed, was that we live in a world where defense has the advantage, and I believe the situation is developing in that direction. Of course, in the last video I also believed that there would be no war because I thought Putin was merely playing with fire. I wasn't able to tell accurately whether his posture was defensive or offensive. Though, fuck him, he wasn't able to tell he couldn't take Kiev in a weekend with his motley crew of war criminals. I um, believe before continuing I must make a short digression on the role of the most fearsome military development to date, nuclear weapons. From them, defense is considered more or less impossible, but attack against another nuclear power is also rational as it invites retaliation. They are thus useless in a classical security dilemma, since we presuppose rational actors. What they do, however, is transcend it somewhat, for they call for a transition of the quest of defense to the pursuit of dissuasion, in which power lies in the resolve to use nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons call for the most totalizing form of the Hobbesian trap, because once the genie is out of the bottle, it is not going back in. Let me segue into something that's important about theories of international relations. Unlike, say, theories in physics that can merely be falsified, our theories can be acted out and performed, and thus even if they don't hold their own when examining reality most of the time, they can briefly become very accurate predictors of reality, the same way a Shakespeare play isn't what you'd go to figure out what's going to happen in the future, but it is what you'd go to if you wanted to spoil yourself before going to the theater. Much like a play, sometimes people can make mistakes on stage or even bring out new ideas and change the script or the way it's presented. Theater nerds know this actually happens a lot. Still though, the original play remains the key to understand those changes because however they may present themselves, they will always remain differences to that original and be meaningful that way. In this example, the script, the key to understanding, as so generously outlined by Putin, is the security dilemma. And now that I've given you a cursory explanation of it, allow me to lay my cards down and show you the good stuff. To be clear, this is purely my vision of things. Uh, you remember when we talked about the rationality dilemmas and how in some situation rationality can fail us? Security dilemmas are just that. And now that we know the conditions in which they happen, if states are the irrational agents Jervis posits they are and they wish to avoid conflict and foster more cooperation, then all they have to do is whatever is in their power to make a defensive posture as distinguishable as possible from an offensive one, and to do whatever they can to make it easier to defend than to attack. Of course, this is not always possible. A lot of it comes down to the luck of the draw and this or that new military technology, and even then, a clear pattern of defensive or offensive advantage can be completely inverted in the prism of every particular configuration of geography, technology, historical context and commitments and many other things. Curiously though, instead of putting forward the conditions for diplomatic exchange and joint security to be possible, Putin has been trying to do the exact opposite of that, to make everything confusing. He's been blurring the limits between an offensive and a defensive posture. He's been trying to draw a worldview where the first person to attack had an undeniable advantage again and again and again. He's been passing off a defensive alliance as a danger to Russia and passing off the preparations for an invasion as military exercises. And the point of that is to make every international relations trained person out there believe that the world was in such a configuration that the Russian narrative could actually be a legitimate point of view that anyone in their place would think. And that diplomacy was necessary instead of arming Ukraine which would lead to an arms race, and that if there were to be a war, it would be over too quickly to help the Ukrainians in the first place. This exploitation of the meta-knowledge of the security dilemma and the necessity of cooperation is in my point of view one of the pillars of the Russian diplomatic doctrine, and its advantages are that, exploiting the natural goodwill of others, Putin 
could paint himself implicitly as the victim of a misunderstanding, of a security, of a security dilemma, in some sort of a novel form of Cass's belly, where one can appear innocent or at least only partially responsible for the conflict they start. People are still falling for this, and if the propositions not to humiliate Russia and the attempts to leave open an avenue of diplomacy are honest, and not merely aimed at like, lolling shitty Russian statesmen into a false sense of security via the promise of the continuity of their shitty statesmanship, then actual heads of state and diplomats are falling for it too. This Putinist subversion is a, not a historical exception or a novelty, but rather another incarnation of a certain way to look at humanity. You see, there have been two competing facets of modernity for the past few centuries that we can find literally everywhere. The pro-enlightenment faction, with its heritage of rationalism, of humanism and of optimism and progress, and the anti-enlightenment faction, which preaches the opposite. Though somewhat more underhandedly and subversively since the Second World War for reasons that are obvious. The difference between these two currents is the difference between defensive realists like Jervis and offensive realists like Mersheimer who were already preaching Putinist propaganda. It's the difference between French nationalism and German nationalism as we'll cover in coming videos, and it is a fault line in our Western societies which is in general very important, and in particular very important to me. You see, it bisects every seminal event in Western history, from the French Revolution to the World Wars to contemporary political events. Anyway, this is a point of contention one must be aware of and think about when we think about security and everybody else, and everything else, really. It's not a mistake that Jervis's theory just assumes a world of rational actors when he very well knew that the Nazis existed and that every so often a stupid dictator or ideologue would just attempt to mess up what he could because he could. In reality, Jervis, who was always concerned with thinking about thinking, offers us a security theory tailored for an Enlightenment-dominated world. Not ready-made to consume, but to interpret following what every actor does with it, just like that Shakespeare play we were talking about. We have to see those who uphold rationality and cooperation, and those who subverted, and how. And that is, I think, the great beauty of it. It is what I wanted to share with you the most. So, if uh, you were paying attention all throughout the video, thank you. I hope you appreciated this. Jervis uh, died last December, the best international relations scholars of his generation. And I sincerely recommend you read his body of work, which is so much broader and profound than what we just talked about today. I really recommend it. Now, that the main intellectual work of the video is over, I'll just slowly let it simmer while telling you about a historical coincidence and how it's related to the current Ukrainian crisis. It uh, has to do with this dialectic quality to security requirements uh, that I introduced here earlier. The dialogue is kind of the chief tool with which you can distinguish an aggressive posture from a defensive one. I have an example which so perfectly mirrors the current crisis in Ukraine. Um, we'll take the famous case of the German Empire building a high seas fleet and threatening British naval supremacy. As um, Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary to King Edward VII, put it, if the German fleet ever becomes superior to ours, the German army can conquer this country. There is no corresponding risk of this kind to Germany, for however superior our fleet was, no naval victory could bring us any nearer to Berlin. The German defense, on the other hand, postulated that without such a high seas fleet in any quarrel between Britain and Germany, German colonies were Britons to hold hostage as she saw fit. Each uh, side uh, thus had legitimate security concerns, but not equal in any sense of the word. For the deprivation of her colonies in case of conflict might wear in some injury to Germany, but never so much as to constitute an existential threat as she was created, creating for Britain. A, uh, a reasonable solution would thus be to present Germany with a security architecture that could make her defend her colonies suitably while allowing Britain not to be challenged in the seas, and that's exactly what the British proposed during the Haldane mission to Germany in 1912. So too, in our current era, Putin appeared to signal his openness to negotiation ahead of a meeting with Biden that was conditioned on Russia not invading Ukraine. 
The Haldane mission would ultimately be a failure as German diplomats revealed they cared nothing for new colonies or existing ones, which were actually seen as a money sink. But instead, they revealed their true ambitions as they offered to slow their naval expansion only in exchange for British neutrality and a coming continental land war. This is happening in 1912, by the way, and was incredibly suspicious back then since it had no bearing, no bearing with colonial policy. As history has a habit of coming back in rhymes, so too did Putin present us with his true goal when attacking Ukraine, which again had little bearing on Ukraine proper. При этом Россия всегда выступала и выступает за то, чтобы самые сложные проблемы решать политико-дипломатическими методами за столом переговоров. Мы хорошо понимаем нашу колоссальную ответственность за региональную и глобальную стабильность. Мы на это соответствующим образом отреагировали. Подчеркнули, что готовы идти по пути переговоров. Однако при условии, что все вопросы будут рассматриваться в комплексе, пакетом, без отрыва от основных базовых российских предложений. Они содержат три ключевых пункта. Первое – это недопущение дальнейшего расширения НАТО. Второе – отказ от размещения альянсом ударных систем вооружений на российских границах. И, наконец, это возврат военного потенциала и инфраструктуры блока в Европе к состоянию 1997 года, когда был подписан основополагающий акт России НАТО. Как раз эти наши принципиальные предложения проигнорированы. Smelling foul play, the British knew better than irreparably offend the balance of power in Europe and withdrew the Haldane mission. What the German Empire was planning was made evident then, but it could have been surmised earlier when to protect their colonies, they were opening a way to an invasion of Britain, and thus equated the two as equivalent. In today's scenario, when Russia is slowly cannibalizing Ukraine and asks for half of Europe to be presented for dinner by removing them from NATO, one may well think the same thing. For Russia talks about its own security, apparently threatened by a defensive alliance no less, and equates it to the security of half a continent, threatened by an actual expanding and ruthless power. Just like the Haldane mission did then, the US retreated from these negotiations. Biden chose the way of light and progressive sanctions instead. He seemingly was presented with the opening to walk away the hero by merely recognizing Donetsk and Luhansk in exchange for Russia walking away. I could not have blamed him for choosing not to delay the inevitable conflict with Russia. But uh, he did. And uh, Ukraine is now under invasion. And though the Putinist regime is facing an existential threat from their failure to perform, which was perhaps the intended goal of Biden's maneuver, one wishes this was not created by expending Ukrainian lives. There we are. I hope you'll find the concept of security dilemma useful. Uh, remember to disregard and rally against those who pretend to want security and safety for themselves, but consider the security of others meaningless. They're not humanists, you're not safe around them. They're not rationalist either, they, they can't be convinced. People like that are unwilling to cooperate in any fashion, generally aggressive, dangerous, and failures of character. The more concessions one makes to Putin's kleptocracy, the more aggressive it's going to reveal itself. The European continent, who for the first time in less than a century feels threatened and rises to create the conditions for a common defense policy, must not succumb to one of its few vices, eagerness to forgive. For it was that same Europe that saw Haldane, and that saw Munich, and that not long ago entertained Putin as if he was some immovable constant of nature, one had no choice but to make their peace with. With any hope, the coming weeks and months will dispel that idea, but regardless, now I believe you have some good notion of state security and international relations, of security dilemmas, of rationality, and of the ideological charge associated with the whole. So this sounds as good as a place as any to stop now. I'll be happy to hear your thoughts in the comments. Remember to join the Discord for some more in-depth talk, research work, and sources. And I should like to end this video by remarking the courage and endurance of the Ukrainian people through this sordid affair. I wish them victory, and along with that the best of futures. May their perseverance break the Russian state. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed this video, that was a lot of effort, but hey, I feel like I'm finally getting the hang of it, and hopefully this leaves you with a reference work on the subject, 
that's pleasant on the eyes. Um, I feel like I've gotten to the level of effort and quality where I finally feel comfortable asking for your support. So, if you want to buy me a drink, or contribute to the destruction of Germany, or more seriously, help me speed up things and get better quality videos out there by commissioning artists, for example, well, I just made a Patreon. I'm still not sure what I'll put in the tiers, probably something like seeing videos a little bit in advance, deciding on stuff I'm on the fence on, uh, seeing video artwork that I generated, and generally just like getting shown things as they go along a little bit before everybody else. I'm superbly new to this, so if you want special stuff, um, just ask for them, and if everybody's okay with them, I guess we'll just do it. Oh. Alternatively, even if you're not a patron, I can always use people to confront my ideas and scripts, to answer polls, to ask about style and art, and to discuss surrounding subjects. So do join the Discord. I find it always helps me to have people around. If you like this video, also consider sharing it with somebody else who might um, like it too, you know? <laughs> and also, starting from next video, I think I'll do a bit where I read some of your comments and answer them on the next one. So get on those keyboards and try to stand out. It's kind of my favorite part to actually read your comments, and I do read them all. I hope I'll, I can do that, like, for as long as I can. I'll be seeing you guys soon. I have a lot of work already done on the next video, and hopefully it should be just as good. Alright, so don't get too impatient. Until next! You are an idiot, you don't understand anything.